we have a little time for questions. I'd like to invite our speakers up. And um, we are actually uh, recording this for uh, both archived and streaming video. So if you have a question, we ask that you use the microphones um, because anything that's not in the microphones directly simply will not be recorded and thus not broadcast. Any questions? Wait, we have to get mics for you. Hang on one second. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I can just repeat the question. Go for it. Sure. Let's do that. Repeat the question. Uh, so, the, so the question is, which archive to give particular materials? And, and actually, in the case of queer issues, it's a real complicated issue because it might be a queer artist, but you think it belongs in your public library because that's about queer history. And, and which archive something ends up in determines how you know the focus. So, if it ends up in the Kinsey Institute, it's going to be about sexual sex. Maybe not so much about art, but if it's going to be in the archives of American art, artists and art historians are going to look at it. And I, I don't have an answer to that, but if I can sort of play off that question, it, it's sort of a question to you, which is that it, it, this, you know, I thought you did a fantastic job in this whole question of the archive and theory. I think in a way we have to be a little careful about literalizing it too much. I mean, the archive that Foucault and Derrida are talking about is really a di an enormous discourse, you know, it, it's the police records, it's everything. And the, and the more you get involved with archives, the more you come to realize that they're nothing like this structured, ordered, scientific thing. And I mean, fortunately, the Archives of American Art is much more rational and I think much more put together. And above all, one thing I, I have to say, I've got to like I'm selling it, but is that they're fantastic about getting the materials out there to a, a huge public. And when you give them things, it becomes part of everyone. We all own it. The whole America owns it, which is kind of great. But there are a lot of lesbian and gay archives, I know that some of you people have worked in, which are just madness. I mean, there is no, the idea that it's some kind of ordered, structured place, instead it's, it's often the reflection of one person who is very, is both eager to both show you stuff or might be very eager not to let you see anything. So it's, it's always this, they're weird places often. Yeah. yeah, and I would just to follow up on that, I would say this is, actually, this is actually part of what I was trying to get at is actually this disjunction between kind of theory and practice, right. you know, and, uh, um, um, you know, and, and the most terrifying thing that you can ever hear is il n'exist pas, or it doesn't exist, when in fact you sort of know that it does. And, yeah. you know, and I was actually really struck I, I, by um, the latest stuff that has come into the Archives of American Art about Rowan Brooks. The first time I saw it, it was in a box, you know, and it's, you know, it included everything from like her grocery lists to, you know, all, to the latest diet she was on. And so I know exactly what you mean, kind right. of sifting through all that stuff. Um, doesn't feel like a particularly orderly endeavor. Right, either. and each, each box might have totally different, yeah. to be organized in a totally different way because of the person who gave the paper. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's more, so there's this one concept of the archive, or many concepts of the archive, and the reality, just like everything else, which is very, very messy and constantly changing. And because it's constantly changing, in a funny way, we all have the possibility. Not, it's not like the Archives of American Art is going to take everything that you give it to them. And there might be some people who will say, no, we don't want your papers. But we also have a, a possibility of seeding our, our, our world into the archive by giving it. So, you know, it's just as this show is dependent on what's in the archive, if there were, if we actually did go to, a, in one case, to someone who had work on John Button, who gave us stuff, who then we could put in the show. So you can see how that can kind of work. And, and so in, vac, in fact, the archive is a kind of constant invention, mm -hmm. a constant recreation, rather than some, you know, static view of history. Well, just one last thing. I think when Foucault and Derrida and all these people are talking about that, we have to keep in mind that they're also saying, you know, it's, I, 
in, in some sense, gay and queer people get accused of reading in all the time. We're always accused of projecting our own sexuality onto everything else. But what they were talking about, above all, was the way that every history is a projection of those things, whether it's about the history of America or democracy, et cetera, et cetera. This is not something that has to be laid at the door of identity politics, right? So right. It's, just, it's not something that you're saying, but no. I just think we need to make that clear. We have sorry. a question yeah, over here. From your experiences uh, searching in the archives, what are your recommendations for people who are donating to the archives um, so we don't have end up having a picture like this where luckily you knew right away who the photographer was, but oftentimes you have no idea? Or is that, do you feel that's even necessary? Or is it part of the fun of being a historian, <laughs> figuring this stuff out yourself? The fun or the madness. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I can actually, I, I, the, I can only actually answer that sort of practically speaking, which is that I had a recent um, experience where I met someone whose grandfather w turns out to have been a fairly prominent turn of the century American artist, and she is sitting on an amazing storehouse of knowledge. But what's great about it is that she herself didn't realize how much that she had scrupulously organized it um, through, through essentially recipe boxes. Um, that she used the individual cards to sort of write down everything and cross-reference. I mean, in some ways, it's like that's, that at least sort of makes sure that the owner of the archive has sort of um, um, had kind of full input and sort of made sure to sort of record everything they know before it, before it goes forward. But it, it also points to the whole process of being art historians on some level, because I know when my, my closest friends, Mark Lita, when he died of AIDS in the early 90s, um, I totally forgot my role as an art historian. I mean, he, he left, he left really, I'm, I'm sort of in charge of his estate, and I was afraid to ask him questions or get morbid about it. And so he left all these things without titles and dates and all these kinds of materials. So the, the answer is, to get as much information that you want. That, the nature of archives is they will preserve that as well. So yes, don't just leave the picture. Leave the picture with all your thoughts that you might have or anything you know about it. Um, but don't, it, it's funny, when death looms, we become terrified and so we stop thinking in these things. And um, I, know, I know, for example, the great, wonderful artist Harmony Hammond is really thinking, has talked to me about how she is working very carefully to make sure that her own work is sort of understood in some kind of context and that is put into some kind of order. And artists, artists need to do that for themselves, actually. Yeah. We have yeah. for one more question, if there's... Where's the spot inside the Bois de Bologna? I don't, actually. Uh, tr and I, I, I know it's nearby. I know. Well, and I will be honest. I mean, it says Bois de Bologna. That's the title that's given it in the archive. And I actually walked around, you know, because I know where Romain Brooks' studio was. And so I just kind of made circles from there. And I never s sort of came to a conclusion about that. So, no, it's a good question. <clears throat> Um, I also just wanted to offer, while we're talking about archives, I just wanted to offer a tip that someone gave me a very long time ago. For those of you who are doing archival work in sexuality, you will occasionally encounter recalcitrant archivists who refuse to show you things that you know they have. And the great trick, which I've used successfully now twice, is to say, oh, but you showed it to me the last time. Um, <laughs> and it always works. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back. Thank you very much.